Chapter 26, The Enchantress's Most Prized Possession. The ground began to tremble and quake under the campsite. What's happening? Connor yelled. It's the Enchantress, Alex screamed. She started her final attack. As if tiny explosions were being set off around the camp, banquets, uh, bouquets of devilish vines burst through the ground and slithered through the site. They knocked over the tents and people as they moved, as if they were searching for something. Jack and Goliolex immediately drew their weapons and began slicing the dem demonic plants, but there were too many of them to fight off. Help! The twins heard a high-pitched scream behind them. They turned around and saw the vines tickle around Red and attempt to drag her back into the ground with them. Someone help me! Jack and Froggy both ran to her, throwing themselves on the ground and reaching a hand toward her. Red was almost all the way underground. Only one her hands was free. She looked to Jack, then to Froggy. If thing, these were the last moments of her life, she had to decide right then and there who she wanted to spend time with. Red grabbed hold of Froggy's hand. He was shocked to see her hand landing on his. You chose me, Froggy said, looking into her eyes. Both of them recognized the significance of this moment. Yes, I choose you, Red said, and a small smile appeared on her face. She pulled him a little closer and kissed his slimy green lips, not repulsed by his appearance or texture whatsoever. The vines climbed over and Red began wrapping around Froggy too. Jack grabbed hold of one of his legs and Goylock grabbed the other. The vines were too strong for them to pull Froggy and Red free, but Jack and Goylox weren't giving up. The vines moved past Froggy and began growing around the whole group, pulling all four of them toward the ground. Alex and Connor were on their way to help them when they heard another cry. Butter boy! Troba yelled from across the camp. The vines had wrapped around her and were dragging her into the ground too. Connor grunted a look around. Can someone else save Trobella? He called out, but all the other trolls and goblins were too afraid of the vines to go near her. Save me, butter boy, Trobella cried. Okay, fine, I'm coming, Connor yelled. He and Alex changed their course and ran to the young troll queen instead. Connor grabbed Trobella's hand and Alex grabbed Connor's feet. They tried to pull her free, but the vines were too strong. This would be so romantic if it weren't for the possessed pulling plants pulling us apart, butter boy. Trobella whispered dreamily to Connor's ear. The vines began to creep past Trobella and into Connor, pulling him with her. Alex, you have to let go of me, Connor yelled behind himself. You can't let the vines get you. I'm not letting you go, Connor, Alex yelled back. You have to save the fairy tale world, Alex, Connor said. You have to save the outer world and mom, too. Alex gripped around her brother's feet, tightened. I can't save anything without you, he said. She said. Yes, you can, he said. It was always meant to be you. You're the one who got us here. You're the one who is going to get us out. You heard the ghost. You're the heir of magic. You gotta defeat the Enchantress so the world can go on. The vine's head wrapped almost completely around Connor. Alex was shaking her head profusely. I can't do it alone, she said, terrified to lose him. Yes, you can, Connor said. I'm really sorry about this. Connor kicked Alex off of him and the vines consumed him entirely. They dragged him and Trollbella down to the ground and disappeared. Connor! Alex yelled after him, but it was no use. He was gone. Alex looked around across the camp just in time to see the vines pull Red, Froggy, Jack, and Goylox to the ground with one final heave. As soon as Trollbella, Red, and the others clinging onto them had been tanking, all the vines of the campsite disappeared into the ground. They had come for the queens. Alex got to her feet and looked around in shock. In a matter of minutes, all of her friends and her brother had been taken from her. She had no choice but to finish their quest alone. It was all up to her now. Bob ran to Alex. Where have they been taken? Alex was wondering the same thing. She looked down at the large cracks and vines that had left in the ground. They weren't just in the campsite, but searched stretched off into the distance as if the vines had left their marks on their way to and from their destination. I have to go, Alex said. She ran to their tent and retrieved the wand of wonderment. She placed it on the troll satchel and threw it on her so over her shoulder. Alex ran off into the distance, following the cracks in the ground as if they were a trail. Where are you going, Bob asked 
as he ran after her, but she didn't respond. Alex! He tried chasing after her, but she was a third his age, and he ran three times as fast as him. Alex never stopped running. Her feet hit the ground in rhythm with her racing heartbeat. She was fueled by adrenaline, but mostly by fear. She could have sworn she heard red screams and Connor's shouts as they dragged under the ground below her. She prayed she would get to the Enchantress before she could harm her brother or the others, and which was wish with all their might that once they got there, she would have a plan to take Esmia's most prized possession away from her. Alex had to think of a way to steal Esmia's pride, not only for a moment, but for the rest of her life. What could she say or do to her that the Enchantress would take to heart and not brush off? How could Alex emotionally scar Esmia so deeply that her pride would never return completely? Could an evil Enchantress take to heart anything that was done or said by a 13-year-old girl? Esme has spent a century imprisoning the souls of kings, soldiers, and fairies in jars. Was someone like Alex capable of leaving a mark on someone like that? Then, like a flash of lightning, Alex realized something for the first time. What she thought of was as a disadvantage was actually in favor. It was because she was a 13-year-old that she had a greater chance of bruising the Enchantress's ego. Ego. If Alex could muster up enough to courage to say something to the Enchantress that a king or fairy never had the bravery to before, perhaps it would have an even greater effect on her. Alex had to choose her words wisely, though. She had to get straight to the point and straight to the punch. The Enchantress's Enchantress wouldn't be listening for very long. It had to work because Alex had run out of ideas and run out of time. After following the cracks in the ground for hours, Alex found herself staring up in a horror at the Enchantress's new home in the Charming Kingdom. The vines dragged Queen and Red and Queen Trobella and the people who clutched onto them for miles and miles underground. They reached the Charming Kingdom and were pulled up the sides of a massive pillar of the earth and into the menacing Colosseum on top of it. The vines instantly pinned the newcomers on the wall. Froggy was hung upside down next to Red. Jack and Goylocks were pinned together with each other's, with their weapon hand beside them. Connor scanned the Colosseum and was sad to see they weren't alone. Hung across the wall from the top of the bomb were Queen Snow White and King Chandler. Queen Cinderella and King Chase. Queen Sleeping Beauty. Queen Chase. Queen Rapunzel and the members of the Fairy Council. And now, with the inclusion of Red and Trouble, the entire Happily Ever After assembly was at the Enchantress's mercy. Oh, good. We're all here, the Esmia said upon Red and Trobel's arrival. The Enchantress was imperially on her golden throne. Her hair and cape flowed across her more aggressively than ever. Rumpelstiltskin peeked out from behind the throne, looking regretfully at the confined monarchs around the room. A large crater was indented in the floor with a small magenta fire burning a pile of skulls like firewood in the center of it. Six glass turquoise shells were placed in line in front of the Enchantress. Connor knew his grandmother was trapped inside one of them. And to Connor's horror, as he looked around the room, his grandmother was the only member of his family being held prisoner in the Coliseum. Pinned to the wall across from him was a giant bird cage, was Connor's mother. She cradled Princess Hope in her arms. The child's cries echo through the Coliseum. The toddler princess could see her mother tangled in the vines beside her and reach through the bars in the cage toward her. Mama! Princess Hope cried. It's all going to be alright, darling, Cinderella said, hoping it wasn't a lie. Charlotte's jaw dropped, and the little color in her face drained away as soon as she saw her son. Connor? she mouthed. So thrilled, yet so terrified to see him in such a horrible place. Mom, he silently mouthed back. Where is your sister, she asked. Connor wasn't sure what the best answer was to give her. Safe, he decided to say. As Mia stood on her throne. Let's begin, shall we, she said. The Enchantress gazed down around the Coliseum with her index finger pressed tightly to her lips. As if she was a little girl in a candy shop. Let's start with the Charming Kingdom, Ismia said. The vines began to rustle. The plants hoisted Cinderella and King Chance off the wall and forced them 
both into a kneeling position on the ground in front of the crater. You soulless monster, Cinderella yelled up at her. Let our daughter go, King Chance demanded. If you want your daughter back, then renounce your throne and hand your kingdom over to me, as Mia said to him. As if it were a simple decision. You'll never have my kingdom, King Chance yelled. The enchantress glared at him through her long lashes. Fine, she said, as Mia snapped her fingers in her vines, reached through the cage and pulled Princess Hope out of, the, out of Charlotte's arm. The child was screaming. Tears and snot ran down her terrified face. The vines dangled the princess over the flames of the fire. No, Cinderella screamed. Do it, Chase, just do it, she begged her husband. King Chance looked to all the other kingdoms and kings and queens of the other room, but no one pleaded with him otherwise. The world would have tried to protect with honor and integrity was long gone. Very well, King Chance said. I renounce my throne and my kingdom to you, Ismia. As he spoke these words, the enchantress threw back her head and her vicious laugh filled the coliseum. The flames into the crater grew higher and the trail of thick black smoke began to fill the sky. Now is that so hard? Ismia asked with a large grin. She snapped her fingers again, and the vines dropped Princess Hope into her mother's eye, arms. The family was only reunited for a moment before the vines dragged them back against the wall. Let's move to the fairy kingdom, Ismia said with a bright smile. The vines brought the seven fairies off the wall and to the edge of the crater. You know what to say, Emerelda, Ismia said, and the, and the leisurely inspected her nails. Make it quick so we can finish this at a decent hour, or do you need further persuasion as well? The vines are wrapped, wrapped around the jar contained the fairy godmother's soul and held it over the fire. All the fairies shouted for it to be released. If it makes you cruel, wrath come to an end any sooner. Fine. I hand you the fairy kingdom to you, Emerald said, against her will. The flame of the crater grew higher and the black smoke had thickened. As Mia closed her eyes and soaked up the moment for all it was worth, her whole body tingled her triumph. She had waited centuries for this, and it was finally happening. One by one, the enchantress called the monarchs before her and forced them to give up their kingdoms. Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel, Trollbella all renounced their thrones with teary eyes and heavy hearts. And with each surrender, the magenta flames rose higher and higher, and the smoke condensed. I just have one thing to say before you put me back on the wall, Trabella said, begrudgingly, staring at Ismia with a tense eyes. You stopped my dancing, and you will never be forgiven. The enchantress, along with every other person in the Cossian, stared oddly at the small troll queen, not knowing what to make of her statement. Finally, there was one, only one ruler left to relinquish her throne. Last, but certainly not least, I call Queen Red Riding Hood of the Red Riding Kingdom to the floor. Red gave a small squeal at the sound of her name. The vines lifted her to the front of the crater. Froggy fought desperately against the vines, hanging him as she was moved. Queen Red, Red. Do you willingly surrender your kingdom to me? The enchantress asked, as if she was ready, already counted on Red's submission. Red looked up at Froggy and at Jack and Goylocks for strength. She knew that was her reunification to the enchantress would have successfully conquered the world. Well, Red Pete, I'm not sure I'm in a position to do that. All traits of accomplishment vanished from Ismia's face. As if it weren't already impossibly high, the attention in the Colosseum grew. Excuse me? Ismia asked with a terrifying scowl. Red went pale. It's easy to explain, Red said, her hands trembling as she spoke. Unlike Everyone else here, I was an elected queen. My kingdom doesn't necessarily belong to me. It belongs to all the Hoodians. Connor, Jack, Froggy, and Goyalox were beaming proudly at her. Even if Red had only bought them a mo minute, it was a minute not all of the Enchantress. Ismia continued to gaze brightly at Red and contemplate the next move. 
Very well, she said. I'll just have every last person in your kingdom killed until you're the only one left. <gasps> no, Red yelled. I lied. I'm the only one with the true authority. It's called the Red Riding Hood Kingdom, not the Hoodie Republic. The evil smirk came back in the Enchantress's face. Then I suggest you proceed, she demanded. Red's eyes filled with tears. She never thought she would be robbed of her own most prized possession on the journey. Her kingdom. I... Queen Red starved, but her voice trailed off. Yes, go on with it, as me ordered. I... I... Continue with difficulty. I... Let me hand you over my kingdom to... Hey, as Mia, said a voice behind Red. Everyone looked up to see Alex at the front of the Coliseum. She was panting and sweating, and she had just climbed the pillar. Alex! Charlotte gasped. The Enchantress was infuriated to be interrupted when Red was so close to finishing. Who is this? she asked. Rumpel still skin. I don't know, Rumpelstiltskin said. I've never seen her before. Alex made her way farther into the Coliseum. She was out of breath and so tired from climbing she could barely stand. Little girl, if I were you, I would turn back around and throw myself to the ground, as Mia yelled. Trust me, it'll be much less painful than what I'm about to do. I'm not afraid of you, Alex yelled. The Coliseum went dead silent. Even the fire seemed to burn quieter. What did you say? The enchantress said blankly. Alex knew the time had come to leave her mark, and she didn't have much time to leave it in. I said, I'm not afraid of you, she repeated. I've dealt with girls like you my entire life. You want everything because nothing will make you happy. You're not an all-powerful and terrifying enchantress, as Mia. You're just a brat. No matter who you kill or what you conquer, people will always pity and laugh at you because of it. The the entire Coliseum held its breath. Ismia maintained her stoic expression, but everyone knew she was outraged beyond belief because her hair flickered violently above her head and small flames burned straight out of her eyes. The enchantress left her throne and slowly strode over to Alex. Alex reached into her satchel. She could feel the wand of wonderment active itself in her, activate itself in her hand. She had succeeded in taking... Is Mia's pride. Well, I hope that little d display was worth it, as Mia said, because it's the last thing you'll ever do. The enchantress pointed her finger at her, and with a bright violet flash, Alex was blasted out of the Coliseum into the sky. Alex! Connor screamed from the wall. It happened so fast. Alex wasn't sure what had happened. The last thing she heard was her brother scream. The last thing she saw was a bright flash, and then the Coliseum suddenly became smaller and smaller, and she soared, soared farther and farther into the air. Everything around her, her sight, her sound, and all her other senses were black, as if Alex had fallen into a very, very deep sleep. All right, that is the end of chapter six. Thank you so much for enjoying that. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to hear more from the Land of Stories, The Enchantress Returns, and more books to come in the future. Also, don't forget to comment down below if you have good suggestions for me to read later on in the future. And hopefully, overall, have you have a wonderful day, and hope you enjoy the read. Bye!